Welcome to this lecture in the series Wednesdays at the Institute Les, 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 les Mercredis de l'Institut of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening. I'm Susan Boynton, resident faculty director, and Emeka Ogbo is a Nigerian sound and installation artist based in Berlin and Lagos. He's residing this year in Paris as a fellow of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination here at the Paris Global Center of Columbia University. Since going to Berlin in 2014 as a recipient of a grant from the DAAD, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, his work has focused on the sonic environment and the food cultures of his hometown of Lagos in a multi-sensorial framework from a perspective that is deeply grounded in the sense of place and yet transcends the limits of geography, rendering his insights timeless and compelling. Through his audio installations and his gastronomic works, Emeka Ogbo explores how private, public, and collective memories and histories are translated, transformed, and encoded into sound and food, framing our understanding of the world and providing a context in which to ask critical questions on immigration, globalization, and post-colonialism. He's interested in the way that sound has the ability to transport people from one space or time to another, and he uses technology in ways that evoke the power of memory. He's spoken compellingly about about this in many videos as well that convey the importance of his work and its interest to a wider audience. In the last few years, Emeka Ogbo's work has been featured in major international art exhibits, art exhibitions, including the Dakar Biennial, the Venice Biennale, and Documenta 2017 in Athens. Also, his work is shown in galleries throughout Africa, Europe, and North America. His works are in the collections of the Tate Modern Contemporary Art Collection of the Federal Republic of Germany, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, and the Ludwig Museum in Cologne, among many others. To name them all, in fact, would take up the time remaining for his presentation tonight. So I would like to refer you instead to the list on the website of his gallery here in Paris, Iman Fares where he had a solo exhibition, No Condition is Permanent, curated in the fall of 2018 by Ugo Chukwu Smooth Nzewi. Emeka Ogbo has received numerous accolades and awards, including being on the shortlist for the Hugo Boss Prize. He received also the prize of the Bocherstrasse in Bremen. And most recently, he and Otto Bong Nkanga were awarded just last week the Sarja Biennial 14 Prize for their project, Aging Ruins, Dreaming Only to Recall the Hard Chisel from the Past. This evening, Emeka Ogbo will speak about his current work that he's doing this year as a fellow of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will be passing around microphones for you to ask your questions as the talk and the questions will be recorded. Questions will be welcomed in French as, 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 as well as in English, and we will provide the translation as needed. Thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, welcome to the Institute of Ideas and Imagination, and thank you, Susan, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. And I want to thank especially my galleries, Iman Fares, who have been supportive of this project. And um, many of you that know me and know my work probably associate that a lot with sound. But tonight, we'll be talking more food and probably beer. And uh, since this is the Institute of Ideas and Imagination, there's no food and beer tonight. I'll leave everything to your imagination <laughs> as much as I can. <laughs> so um, this kind of is introductory. It wasn't meant to be the introductory text, but um, um, I, I was going through my archives when I saw this. And I, I think I saved it, but I can't remember who specifically said this. But it talks about how people of color view food and how we've been called out for um, the smell of our food. And I, you know, I, you'll see the connection later at some point. But I also wanted to point out that I will also call out the French. You know, <laughs> <laughs> these are the things that make the fridge smell like something died in it. <laughs> but. It's not the point of what we're here for today. All right, 
I think I'll have a little bit of problem to pronounce this. I tried to cram this the whole day. Le Bru, Le Dor, right? <laughs> and um, this, I found a text from Michael Cronin titled um, Cooking the Books. It's on translation, food, and migration. He was basically trying to make this connection with um, um, a statement that Jacques Chirac did in uh, 1991. So Jacques Chirac was uh, in a dinner for the supporters of his party when the subject of immigration came up. And this is the translation, the English translation of his text. It's, it's better in French, actually, but um, l'odeur, le bruit l'odeur, noise and smell was something that popped up and I'm very much interested in. Um, I can read that quickly. The problem is not foreigners as such. It's that there are too many of them. It is perhaps true that there are no more foreigners now than there were before the war but they are not the same foreigners. That's the difference. Without a doubt, having Spaniards, Poles, and Portuguese working for us is less of a problem than having Muslims and black people. How do you expect the average French worker living in Goudon or neighborhood in Paris, where I went for a walk a couple of days ago, who along with his wife earns around 15,000 francs and who sees a family pardon across the landing in this council block with husband, his three or four wives and about 20 kids who earn 50,000 francs in benefit without doing a day's work, of course. That's an applause. And uh, if you add that to the noise and the smell, your French worker on the landing is going mad. But then he also goes on to talk about the good immigrants. The majority of these people work hard they are good people, we are happy to have them here. How many times would we have had nothing in the house to eat if the Algerian corner shop owner wasn't open from seven in the morning till midnight? So uh, Michael Cronin basically sums it up like, bad migrants cook up foul smelling stews with their compatriots in overcrowded ghettos, Lado. Is my pronunciation good? And good migrants, Le Pisse Cabio, right? <coughs> are the indispensable part of the food chain, without whom the honest laborer would go hungry. In both instances, Chirac uses food as a way of demonizing and glorifying the other, a natural metaphor to translate the delusional logic of rejection and the unpalatable fact of dependency. And uh, this kind of sums the whole thing up where food and migration has always been kind of thrown together into the uh, mix. And um, I will now jump to my story. Uh, 2014, I moved to Berlin. I was invited to do the DAD uh, residency for a year. And uh, prior to that, I've traveled a lot and I'd never thought about food being an issue. So I show up in Berlin with two luggages filled with just books, clothes, and equipment. No one told me to come with uh, food and spices. <laughs> and uh, that became a problem after two weeks <laughs> living in Berlin. I spent uh, the rest, most of the time, early, early Berlin, sort of hunting for food. You know, I need something spicy, I need something hot. And this was one of the first German words that I learned, chef. You know, people will, oh, the f you know, like, oh, we are not, we, you can get some German food, but it's probably not chef enough for you. And whenever you speak to Africans living in Germany, it's always like, you know, the complaint is the food is not chef enough. <laughs> so I learned this first, um, that's probably one of the first words I learned in Germany. Same way I learned about Pimor since I came here. And uh, probably my vocabulary in French is still tiny, but I know how to ask for beaucoup Pimor in my food when I go to the restaurant. So um, this is my Berlin 
Google Map. So these are, this after like three years, four years in Berlin, and 70% of what you see here are all food related. These are bars, restaurants, grocery stores, where I can basically try out food because that's what I spent most of my time doing in Berlin because food became such an important factor uh, for my stay in Berlin. It wasn't just about finding African food or like food that is sharp enough, but I was also curious to try out the local food. And so I spent a lot of time hunting for food and that's how I developed this map. This is what my Google map of Berlin looks like. The green spots are supposed to be where I'm still going to check out and I probably checked out most of them and I forgot to switch them to either the red heart or the star but um, I'll, I'll do that someday. So I accumulated all this and um, really got it, it, it really got me thinking about like the connection of food and migration and the kind of work I was doing. And um, it was also at this point that I found uh, a very good African restaurant called Ebano. It's in Berlin. And uh, this is where we ended up, we end up eating most of the time. And um, one thing I found very interesting going there was, it wasn't just about the food anymore. It was about the company. It was about the connection of people. People speak your language, or even if it's not the same language, we all vibe together. It was during the politics, it was during the election in Nigeria 2014 or so, so that then there was a lot of discourse on politics. We spend time now there not just to eat, but to connect with home. It was it became like a communal thing we we'll go up there doing. This is um this is Guinness, but it's not the Guinness you know. This is a Nigerian Guinness. We want our thing wherever we are. When you get used to it, that's what you want to keep having. So this kind of drew me into the idea of creating works around food. How does food and politics relate in general? Germany, you would not find fresh vegetables from Africa or like any fresh food for importation. They have rules and regulation against that. And uh, I think it's a bit easier here in uh, France. So you start substituting with ingredients. And so when you want to talk about the idea of assimilation, how do you settle down in a place, you start looking at food that could taste a bit similar to what you know and how you substitute it. You start playing that whole game of uh, food and migration in general. And um, this was when I started thinking about like creating works that will correspond with food. And one of the first early works I did was called Continental Entree. Um, what we did for this piece was we looked at the uh, EU countries and looked at the um, GDP, unemployment rate, and um, what else again, the statistics or percentage of the migrants or immigrants, especially from Africa, moving to these places. And when we came up with the data, we um, now quickly move to this. We gave um, each country a Michelin star. So when I talk about like working with food, it doesn't necessarily mean cooking, but using like food connections to create like artworks. So this is your typical. This is your typical um, EU blue, EU yellow, and this is a sign for restaurants. But I converted it to the flags of different countries, and awarded them Michelin stars depending on what the statistics pulled up in general. The UK had two stars, France had two stars. Um, somewhere like Greece and Spain had one star. The main part of this work was this neon, food is ready. Food is ready is a general theme you're going to find when you go to a lot of West African roadside restaurants. It's this big sign, you know, advertising the availability of food in these places. And it's really like trying to welcome you to come in and eat, but then the food is not free, right? And uh, this is also how Europe is in general, where it's all this tourism advertisement, but it's not for everyone, you know. The migrant without money cannot really get into Europe. And that's why the sign has this 
E instead of uh, it has this euro sign instead of E and it's this sign that goes on and off it's really about the uncertainty of these places so this was one of the early works that was actually inspired by these conversations we had in this restaurants because this is where you meet people <clears throat> people bring their friends to eat there and if anyone is visiting Berlin let's go to Eban and have dinner and that's where you see different Africans from all parts of Europe turning up and giving their own perspective of where they are living in Europe, how they ended up there, how, um, you know, if they want to move, and everybody's asking questions of how is Germany, how is it treating you guys, and maybe I should consider moving here. So that's how this work was born. Another work that I did around that time, it's this is a very <laughs> famous quote in Nigeria, Beta Soup Namonikila, basically it's saying, you know, if you want good food, you have to spend money. If you want good life, you have to spend money. And that is the story, that is the story of the migrant or immigrant coming to Europe to hustle. It's really about like making money and sending them back home. And this is what it's on now. It's like, it's the okra soup with the hundred euro notes in it. It's real money, I couldn't find fake money, you know. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, because then we actually called the police to ask them if they had like counterfeit we could uh, use for this piece and we were nearly arrested. So it was cheaper to use a hundred euro notes and because of the color blending with that. But so this kind of like led me to start thinking about like creating works that will be around food. And that's when I'm gonna introduce uh, the beer project in line with what I'm doing also here in Paris. So um, in 2015, I was invited for a solo exhibition in Paris. That was one year after uh, DRD. And I was wondering what I would do for this exhibition. How do I sum up my one year in Berlin? And I just knew that the exhibition would definitely be around food and the concept of food. So one year in Berlin, I think I got a little bit bored with art. You know, around you is all artists, curators, collectors. The circle is basically artists. And that, was, that got really boring for me. And I started um, hanging out with the beer people because I'm in Germany, it's all beer. Craft beer was booming in Berlin then. And um, I got into trying to brew beer instead of make my artworks. But along the line, I also had to realize that I'm still an artist and this is like how I'm supposed to get fed. So how do you bring these two together? You have to create a work around beer. So, but it all started like more like a, an experimental joke. Let me put it like that. When I, when I had this exhibition, I had the idea of creating a beer for the opening instead of like I was buying beer. And um, I started thinking around what could I do? How do I sum up my one year in Berlin as an immigrant, or as a migrant, or as an expatriate? And uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna make this beer, but what would be the name of the beer? I came up with the name Sofahead Original. Um, this was inspired by Fela Kuti who in the 80s released this track called Original Suffer Ahead. And the track kind of like summed up the political s situation in Nigeria in the 80s, which happened to be one of the biggest decades of mass immigration out of the country. Because of the um, military regime, a lot of Nigerians left the country then. So when I think about a good soundtrack for the 80s, which is around a migration out of Nigeria, Original Suffer Ahead comes to my head and that's where we got this name from. But it's also this whole idea where if you are a black person, most likely, or if you're an African, especially in Europe, most likely you're running away from home. You know, you're suffering at home. This impeaching means someone that is suffering. It's more like a satire to it. But it's really about like this kind of approach where people will be like, oh, are you a refugee? You know, I live in Germany, I pay taxes, I employ Germans, but a lot of people would also still see me as a refugee for, for not being at home. So I, I decided to go with this name, Sofahead Original, and we came up with this idea to create a craft beer that is inspired by the food tastes and experiences of Africans living in Europe, especially Germany, 
which communicates some of the received stereotypes, politics of difference, and integration associated with their expatriate faith to the brewing and branding of the beer. So this project is not just about making beer, and I'm going to walk you through the process of uh, doing this. Um, this is still part of the text. So this was one of the first things that made me think about making a project. This is Reinheitsgebot. but it's a German word. And basically what it means is the purity order, sometimes called a German BA purity law in English. <clears throat> it's a series of uh, regulations limiting the ingredients in beer in Germany. So basically, according to this 1516 Bavarian law, uh, beer is only considered beer if it's just water, barley, and hops. This was in uh, 1516 when the concept of yeast was discovered. They threw in yeast into this. So four ingredients, you can only make beer with four ingredients. If anything is there, it's no longer considered beer, right? Crab beer brewing is more experimental where people do all kinds of, you know, you can brew whatever you want, but in Germany they would not consider it beer. And I found that interesting. This is the same way dark-skinned people or someone looking different who was born in German, whose parents were probably, have probably naturalized as Germans, will also be asked like, where are you from? They speak German, they know German, that's all the thing they know all their life, they know Germany. And just because they look different, there's always this question of identity, where are you from? Citizenship becomes broad, you know? So I connect Reinhardt's Gibbot to citizenship because if you have this purity law, that talks about BA purity. It's the same way a lot of the citizenship laws in Europe try to talk about purity. Things have to be pure, no mixtures. If you look different, you are not really one of us. So this was one of the ideas that led me to try to, uh, that started working with this beer project. And then this is the beer SRM, which is like the standard reference method for beer. So it starts from the lightest to the darkest. It's like the pills, blondes. And it goes to the darkest, the schwarz, the black. But, um, you know, this is kind of like the beer scale. Imperial stout is the darkest, 40 plus. Then you have the pale lager on two color. But what I found interesting was also how they resembled um, von Luskan chromatic scale, which is, I don't think they use this anymore, but it's this chromatic scale for skin color, how uh, skin colors are coded also start from the lightest to the darkest and this kind of how it spreads out over the places so when i look at this two situation this color coding and Reinhardt's gibbot i'm like you know what i can actually continue with my art and making beer so let's put things together and uh, create this beer so this beer Safahed original was born we brewed it the first time in berlin in 2015 it, it, it didn't even have a logo then i just brewed the beer and um, you know, it's it's uh, a result of my research over the year. One year I spent in Berlin, especially around food, and asking questions, especially uh, the Africans, and putting together this whole idea into an analytical software that gave me um, keywords of this research, and we tried to develop a beer out of it. So what this beer basically tasted like was a, you know, there was a coffee, um, then. One key note every time is there has to be chili in the beer. Because when you ask any African about the food, it comes down to that shaft. It has to be uh, spicy. So we first brewed this beer and I forgot about it till one year later. In New York, I was offered a solo exhibition at the Gothe and I really had nothing to show. And I'm like, you know what, let's, let's create a brand for this beer instead. And that's how we developed this logo. And this is kind of your typical beer logo, like Gothic. And um, it's it's also kind of very German. But when I talk about migration, I'm not so much interested in it being one-sided. I like the idea of this fusion of two places. So for me, I needed something local and the logo popped out like that. So the beer was born. And um, I go walking down the process of how we created this whole design. Um, the bottle is completely opaque. Oh, by the way, this is the Frankfurt edition. Um, this is not the one for Documenta. You know, when, when you look at the skin color, and then when we go back to that color tone, the darkest is also like the blackest. 
and we're talking about melanin here so for me it was important to have the bottle completely black and opaque because when people have a situation with racism people kind of confront you just by the way you look they don't know anything about you they don't know your content they don't know your depth so this bottle you can never see the liquid content it's completely blocked out then for the beer it was very important for it to have a thick foam head this um, yeah when you brew you put all those all these things into consideration then the RSM standard reference method 40 plus really dark imperial style that's the darkest and that's also refers to the melanin skin. Then uh, ABV, talk about ABV, uh, the beer, the alcohol by volume. And uh, when you talk about strength of a beer, it's really about the alcohol. And one of the stereotypes of being African is that, you know, we're strong, that's why we ended up as slaves. Um, so it's minimum of 8% anytime the beer is brewed. Then it's full bodied, you know, full body kind of describes the viscosity of the fluid in your mouth and um, and that also has to do a lot with our food and flavors so these characteristics sort of summed up whenever I'm brewing this beer it has to have this characteristics then chili has to be there you know but what I what I what I do with the beer basically is um, it stays every physical aspect of this beer stays the same but the flavor denotes changes and this happens wherever it's been brewed because if the migrant, as a migrant, if you move from one place to the other, you still stay the same, but maybe you learn a new language, maybe you're you're eating different food, the contents inside kind of change, but the physical aspect stays the same. So over the years, we've done the Baden Baden edition, the Castle edition for Documenta, and uh, the latest one we did was Frankfurt, and I'll jump to the the Paris edition at some point uh, during the presentation. But I think uh, the whole concept of the beer from the logo, the bottle and everything really worked out in general. My background is graphic design, so I spent time working on this. And um, fortunately, the Design Museum in London selected it as one of the products uh, of the year awards. We didn't win it, but it was, it was on the selection for 2017. So, now we've talked about the beer and you know most times people ask me you know but you're just like you're just brewing beer are you a beer artist i'm not actually i i see the beer as an entry point into a bigger conversation and the big conversation for me is the branding when you create a product you brand the product right and um my background being graphic design before I got into the arts, I spent time working freelance as a designer, adverts, so it was really fun going back to what I sort of loved doing. So for Documenta, we brewed uh, 50,000 bottles of this beer. It was like an invasion. You know, the dark beer, the Schwarz beer, is not so popular in Germany or most of Europe. It's, it's also kind of re reflects or relates to the situation of the black population you know it's we are generally outnumbered so for me it was very important to flood castle with this beer and then we had the we had the uh, um, outdoor adverts <coughs> everywhere around castle if you're around documenta you could have you could have probably seen some of them but what was interesting is the tagline they has and for Schwarz. this is german for who is afraid of black and um, this came from this school, schoolyard game, the hats thanks for Schwarzman, who's afraid of the Schwarz, uh, the black man. It's it's kind of been pushed to be banned because of a lot of people consider it, you know, derogatory, racist. Is the same situation the black pit or the dark face is in like places like Netherlands and Holland, and. Um, I decided to work with this tagline because this kind of is a trigger, it's a mnemonic to, you know, at the same time we're saying who's afraid of a uh, black beer, it's still a beer, but you know, everyone gets, this triggers this every time. And a lot of questions were raised or people, you know, during documentary, you find people coming to these billboards to take pictures and like, ish nicked, not me, you know, the Germans standing there taking pictures next to this, like, I'm not afraid of black. It's kind of pushed a kind of response in general. 
But um, you know, I live in Germany. You see all that every time. You see situations where there are spaces. I, I think I'll call it more of politics of spaces where you are kind of as as an African or as a black person. Maybe you are not supposed to be there. Actually, uh, one of the racist thing that I got confronted with Germany in Germany was this word like you're not supposed to be there you know but um it's also where when you get into these spaces you understand why someone kind of makes this reference or you know you walk into a, you walk into maybe a bar a certain expensive bar and the kind of ideas of being African people have of you is you as a refugee you really cannot afford to buy these drinks it was also, uh, I mean, I saw that too. One time we went for drinks uh, somewhere near Halensi. And, uh, you know, when I'm hungry, I'm, I'm hungry. I love food. And I pile my plate with food. So when I get to the place I'm supposed to pay, you know, this guy looks at me and, you know, looks at the food and goes like, you know, this, this is expensive. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not a problem. But when I sat down to eat, I understood why he made that comment. I was the only black person there sitting down to eat, the other black people were there, two cleaners. So these are the kind of people they're used to. And then, you know, this kind of thing comes up, you cannot really afford this food. Um, so I'll move to part of what we did for Brandon. Uh, in, 2000 and, in 2017, I was invited to Baden Baden to create a solo exhibition. And um, if you know Casino Baden Baden, it's the oldest casino in Germany or maybe in Europe. Um, you know, you walk in there, it's a fancy place. And um, it was also the kind of situation where the only blacks you're going to see in this space were the cleaners. You know, you hardly see any dark skinned person in this casino. And we're basically, I was told, you know, you can ask if I can work with this space. I was like, sure. You know, I'm like, okay. So these are like portraits we created in these places. And um, it also brings me to talk about the process of the branding that I work with. Three things stand out for me when I'm working on this project. Fashion, food, and uh, music. It's all about taste, thanks to Tina. You know, so, but... I like the idea of working with fashion because I see cultures embedded in fashion. So these are uh, works, these are uh, clothings are from uh, Afro-Germans or Africans living in, in Germany. It was specifically, it specifically had to be that to create this kind of impression. Um, so um, these were works out of this shoot, but I'm going to I'm going to play you the one the one minute thirty seconds commercial video we shot. It was really about taking over a space. It was really about celebrating blackness, but uh, it was inspired by this whole situation where I was basically asked, um, you know, you're not supposed to be here because they don't see so many black people here. So 
Yeah, so it's it was very important to you know like this looks like a very typical beer commercial. It's all about celebrating beer, but when you start peeling these layers, having this shoot in this historic space in a casino Baden Baden, where it sort of flipped around. All the servers were white Germans, and all the bowlers were the Africans. But it's not just about like creating something like sniding this or whatever, but I also wanted to celebrate the fashion and the, you know, because this whole impression of Africans being um, suffer heads or like uh, refugees, you know, these guys, they look, you know, they're, 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 they're Africans in uh, Germany paying taxes, employing Germans, doing really well. It wasn't just about that notion of you, you're either a cleaner or you're a street sweeper or you're something like that. So these works were kind of developed around this. And um, in continuation of working with fashion, um, I was invited by Monopole to you know, create uh, an editorial. And, um, I wanted to go with fashion too, but it wasn't just about creating a fashion shoot for this magazine. My idea was to do these fashion shoots in certain places in Berlin. So it was called Berlin Postcolonial. In Berlin, you still have all these um, monuments, spaces that kind of connect to um, the colonial past of Germany. And the truth is, many people do not know about these spaces. Even a lot of us Africans, you know, we show up in Germany, we show up in Berlin, and we go to some places, we take pictures and to celebrate uh, Berlin. But many of them do have a kind of colonial past. For example, this is Charlotte Mugator, and um, this is a monument to Frederick, Frederick I and his wife, Sophie. And um, Frederick I were, you know, they were the, the place known as Ghana now. They, they, they built a base there in 1683 and um, sold it to the Dutch or so at some point. But what was interesting is that over 20,000 slaves were you know moved to the America under Frederick the First in this um, uh, in this period while they you know when they had the Brandenburg African Company and um, many people do not know the history of such spaces so having these shoots in these spaces was a way of bringing that into pers perspective but I also like the idea where um, like uh, the this is America video. Everything happens in the foreground while a lot is happening in the background. We're not paying attention. So for many people, this is just a typical fashion shoot. You know, beautiful people and beautiful clothes. But then it's at the Charlottenburg Bogator where Friedrich the First monument stands. Uh, these were from there. Another spot where we shot was in uh, Humboldt Forum. Humboldt Forum is this rebuilt castle. It's still going on. It's in the museum district in uh, Museum Island in Berlin. It's still under construction. But this will house um, all the artifacts. I think the Germany has, like, in, uh, in Berlin, there's like 70,000 artifacts from Africa. Most of them unlawfully moved or like stolen, not even moved. They were stolen and it's all in Europe. It's all in Germany. If I have to see a lot of stuff from Nigeria, especially from the, the Benin, I probably have to do that in Germany and they will be housed in the Humboldt Forum. We also had a shoot there where we kind of put that into perspective and for every uh, part of this shoot, there's a text on, on these places. And um, it's also like the black body taking over these places. Then this is uh, Volkspark Rebeck is this park in Berlin where in 1906, this dude has some genius idea to set up human zoos in this space. And this was supposed to house uh, Africans in the zoo. We also had a shoot there and there were texts about these places too. And um, um, <coughs> then this is the Bismarck Monument. So Lord Bismarck is the guy that set up the Berlin conference where they took the decision to split Africa the way we have it now, you know, but it looks like a nice monument in uh, Berlin and it's one of the most publicized picture taking places. So, mm -hmm. you know, we took over the space too. And um, this was a billboard that came out of the project, the Hacks Hans for Schwarz. It's like a huge billboard mounted now. So yeah, I, I, you know, we 
made a lot of works around this whole situation, working with African fashion designers, styling these beautiful people and taking over these spaces. And um, that brings me to Suffered Paris edition. Uh, when I was uh, invited <laughs> to be at Columbia, of course, that was a good reason to come here to work on the project, but very important also to experience the food. You know, I said it, this is my Paris graph right now, and actually these are mostly African restaurants. It's a lot of things here, but they're mostly African restaurants. So let's say I've been eating my way through Paris, and uh, it's been it's been good. Um, so I'm here in Paris researching on um, the position of Africans in our contemporary France, and my entry point was food. You know, what we normally do for this project is you know have a kind of research where we have questions asking people one on one and stuff, but. One of the easiest ways to pull this off here was to actually go to a lot of these restaurants, talk to the people there, the chefs, how do they bring in their food, where do they shop, where do they buy food, or what do they substitute if they don't find. Fortunately enough, you can find many things you want here in, uh, in Paris for we Africans trying to cook. And that brought to Chateau Rouge, one of, I think I find this is probably one of the most interesting. I, I, I also work with sound, so for me, you know, the first day I came to Chateau Rouge, coming out of the staircase, it, it felt like I was in some African city, and I really, uh, that blew my mind completely. The energy is there, and um, this is where you probably find every food African. Um, so I spent a lot, of, I spe I've been spending a lot of times here, and working on my research for Paris edition. It's a lot of text, it's still going on, but I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. But I'm just going to dive quickly into how the BN notes for Paris edition is coming up. You know, like I said, we do a lot of research to make the beer, but here it was a bit complex because when we talk about colonial past, I don't think uh, France that is applicable because uh, there's still some kind of colonization going on till now. And um, I decided to look at, take another route in general. So I looked at the relationship between France and Africa to the present and decided to work with certain ingredients for the beer that we'll, we'll revisit later when we start talking about the branding and the adverts for the beer. And I looked a lot at one of the ingredients for the Paris edition will be cocoa beans. And I was looking at the statistics for importation of cocoa. And 55% uh, comes from only Cote d'Ivoire. So I think uh, we decided so far that there will be these coconuts and they have to be from Cote d'Ivoire. Same with coffee. This is the statistics for coffee importation in general, or the African relationship with uh, France. And um, molasses, the beer would definitely be sweetened by molasses. I've worked with honey before for the castle edition. But why molasses? It's it's kind of it's this uh, it's what you get from boiling down sugar cane, and when you look at the history of France, especially in the 16th century, a lot of the slave routes were set up um, in the Caribbeans or in the islands for sugar plantations. So using these ingredients in the beer is a kind of way when we start creating works around the beer, we have to highlight these things and pinpoint these things. So these are like the kind of connections you'll be making with food. And of course, there'll be piment in the beer, definitely. And um, these are my, these are the people I've been working with. It's a brewery in uh, Chateau Rouge, it's called Brasserie. Uh, the La Gouteau Rouge. Goto. And um, I found these guys and what I like about their beer brewing because whenever I brew the beer, I always like working with the locals. It's very important. That's what I mean by migration not being one-sided. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a fusion of two places. The locals, for me, the beer brewers always have to be from where I'm working. So we would develop the recipe for the beer together. They are based in Chateau Rouge. I like that. And they've been making some conceptual beers around the whole um, diversity of Chateau Rouge. They're already like kind of working in that direction. And um, an interesting person I'll be working with is uh, Ma Chef Malonga. He's based between Paris and uh, Rwanda at the moment. 
you know, what I like about making the beer is they say beer is a new wine. So we have this kind of situation called beer pairing where it's not just about uh, drinking the beer, but making food around the beer. This is what I also hope to be part of the conversation along the line where food is paired with the beer. And um, then for fashion, I've been talking to people, and uh, one of the people, few people I talk with so far is Maison Chateau Rouge. It's a fashion brand based in Chateau Rouge, and they're also creating fashion that kind of looks at this uh, identity of two places, fusion of two places. And then um, I'm interested in these spaces, just like what we did in Berlin, where you find these spaces that are connected to the colonial past in France, and one interesting person I've met and did a work with so far is uh, Le Paris Noir. He does this guided talk uh, tours around uh, France, pointing out different places that kind of uh, connect to Black Paris. And these are the people that so far in my research and the work I've been doing so far, I've been working with and connecting with to brew the beer and create the advertisement for the beer. Finn. Thank you. questions <laughs> how well is it sold uh, sorry how well is it sold how well or how will it how well has did the beer did the stout sell in in uh, germany and how well do you think it'll sell in france i'm not a i'm not a i'm not a beer artist <laughs> let's let's start with that you know actually it's uh, it's kind of thing that comes up in general with this there's a lot of politics involved in selling beer, and I try to stay away from that completely. So my partners handle this, you know, like when I work with a museum, we have the funds to do, uh, I'm more focused on brewing the beer and creating the works around the beer They can take care of the selling. You know, there's a whole beer mafia that don't want you sipping into their uh, setup. So I stay away from that, but it's, it's, it's done well. Like uh, Baden Baden sold out. I don't want to call the prices, but it went up. Uh, Documenta, we had 50,000 bottles. We sold uh, more than half of that before Documenta ended. And um, the, the, some of these bottles, are, some of these beers are turning up on eBay now and they're trying to sell it on eBay. So I think it's really doing well. Um, same with Baden Baden, same with Frankfurt. Frankfurt is still on at the moment. Paris, we'll see. You know, but it's craft beer. Craft beers are normally not that cheap. It's I mean, starting with the bottle, just the design and everything is expensive already. But I'm not into the selling details. I don't have that statistics. I try to stay away from that as much as possible. Yeah. No, Nigeria is not diaspora. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I think that people of color are either represented as migrants or people that are really wealthy. So are you um, are you doing anything to represent the people who are you know not either super rich or super poor? You know, there's always this notion that Africans are poor. You know what I mean? Like it's it's uh, that's why I was happy to make that video in the casino showing a different side. I wouldn't say different side, but you know. People don't see this side normally, so I'm 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 trying to represent everybody. You know, there's this. If if you look at if you look at the television channels here, I don't know if it's the same in France. I haven't seen any TV in France, but uh, in Germany, it's really it's really about these guys trying to swim across the Mediterranean, or you know, dying there or on the boats. Not people that actually can get visas and come to holidays in in Europe and go to casinos and gamble away their money because they have that money to spend, you know. There's a broad spectrum. It's not just the poor people. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Emika, um, your work has 
help me to understand sort of, your work is kind of the best of multi-sensory work, artwork. And so the way in which you've been able to um, get us to think about food as multi-sensory and not just about the taste that you feel or that you experience when you are consuming it. So the taste that, I mean, one of the things with the Chirac um, quote that was so extraordinary is that he was talking about smell as an offense, not simply to those who are partaking of it, but it's enforced upon people. Yeah. Um, so, so food has smell, food has taste, so it's olfactory, it's gustatory, it's visual. It's also sonic in terms of all of the stuff that goes into um, making it, preparing it, consuming it. So I guess I'm wondering, the, the fashion stuff that you do is yeah. the most visual. And I wonder if in your work you have the different ways of rendering food multi-sensory. So do you have sort of a sonic representation of food? Do you have a visual representation of food? And how does your work try and mix media to represent that multi-sensory diasporic experience? Um, I mean, that's very interesting. And, um, you know, I don't have a template to create this per se. You know, I go with the flow and see how it ends up. Starts with, um, when you talk about Sonic, what we try to do, especially with the jingle, was to create this kind of jingle that incorporates the stuff I had, especially as inspired by Fela Kuti. But then one of the things I'm doing is I'm kind of curating music, especially from African musicians that talks about being abroad. You know, like the whole experience. There's actually a very famous Nigerian musician that talked about like trying to eat fufu in, in uh, I think it was in London. And they thought he was committing suicide because he had these big balls he was trying to swallow. So it's, uh, you know, there's also the sonic side of that, but it's not focused per se on the sonic. Like I said, it's really like what I get inspired to work with along the line there. So it's funny you ask this question because I'll be doing a project next year and they were asking me, how do you want to present it? I'm looking at the multi-sensory and I think it's gonna come on its own like that. I think about it, but I don't have any template on how that turns up. It's kind of an unfair question. Um, <laughs> what's the best temperature to drink up ahead? Uh, <laughs> As between me and you. <laughs> you know, um, stout is best drunk on room temperature, according to Europeans. You know, but when you are when you are in the tropics, mm -hmm. our, our, you know, it's it's the colder the better. Nobody's gonna drink any hot stout or like room temperature stout. No. We like it ice cold, you know, but it, at, in, on room temperature, you can feel all the, you can taste all the notes in the beer, but we don't care. <laughs> Actually, Nepa is the power supply company in Nigeria and uh, we have a big power situation. So we, we, we got you, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So we have one question in the front and then we have one in the back. Oh, that's pressure. Emeka, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I learned so why, much. Why do I think you're coming after me? <laughs> do you know what? Emeka, let me tell you something. As I was watching this, I, I, want, I basically, I think it's going to take me until tomorrow to formulate this question properly. Okay. But I'm going to try, so forgive me. We're all friends. Do Sorry, everybody else. I can also answer it tomorrow. No, answer it now. <laughs> because I was, I was impressed to see how the earlier form of your practice as a graphic designer took form with the Sufferhead beer. Oh. I found it really fascinating, this journey. I knew your work more when you worked with sound and urban scapes. I'm still doing that. I know, but I mean, sort of, I connect, I still sort of associate that very strongly because I felt like your early work was important because it was very much a celebration of the contemporary urban, urban experience and turning, like in Lagos soundscapes, turning something which for a foreigner would appear like a difficult, cacophonous way to journey into something which celebrated the dynamism of talk of discussion, of the banter of the taxi ride, of the urban, the urban city as a kind of form of music or a composition. So there are the ways in which you took cliches that were attributed towards the Afri African urban experience and turned it into a kind of nostalgic celebration of that and very kind of also future orientated. Mm -hmm. 
So when people looked for criticism, where criticism was expected, celebration was found, mm -hmm. right? So with this new work, or newer work, the work of the past five years, where you're spending more and more time producing in Europe, I feel, I literally, I literally in my mind as you were talking, I'm like, ah, <laughs> this is somebody who grew up with African policemen, African politicians, African doctors, African teachers, landing in Europe, experiencing Europe for the first time as a minority without maybe the protection that those of us who grew up under racism in the diaspora mm -hmm. necessarily had. So I feel like there's a kind of initial shock at confronting social and institutional racism that then has found its way into your recent work with the Sufferhead beer. Um, and I wondered if you sort of had a, a conscious... Because there's something much more politically activist and much more engaged in identity politics in this work, even though there's a part of it where you're just trying to put the black into bourgeois, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and justifying this sort of middle class existence that is also not allowed to be normalized in a racist society. So do you know what I'm asking you? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I think God this is being recorded I think I'm asking you to talk about this transition towards making work which tries to attack and resolve social and cultural racism in unexpected ways through material culture um, I'll start I'll start with uh, no no I'll start I'll start with uh, you talked about like the sonic work the sound legal soundscape I, I didn't show Actually, for Munster Sculpture 2017, I also brewed a beer. It wasn't just my sound installation, but what we did was we fermented this beer to the sound of Lagos. It was a beer, crab beer design for Munster. Munster smells of uh, this lime flowers in summer around the promenade. So we crafted this beer with the lime flowers and the uh, honey from, from Munster. Then during the fermentation, we plug transducers on the fermentation tank and the yeast vibrated to the sound of Lagos for three weeks. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not done with that yet. I'm also working with that. So talking about this aspect, I hope I got what you were asking, but the whole point is this is also something I experienced. That's why I say experiences. I talk to people. It's not just like trying to create some fancy stuff. Some of this I experienced, some of these people, you know, like my ideas for creating these adverts and, and works around that is really on, based on one-on-one -on -one engagement. And people tell me all kinds of stuff, then I try to look at the ones that I can take and uh, create something out of it. So it's not, a, it's not just about like coming over to Europe and jumping onto this. These were experiences, some of them I, I got and some of them my friends or some of them people that I talk with got. Did that answer your question? In I some ways, more, right? I mean, the question, I suppose the question is, is also that there's a kind of conscious transition towards helping to redress some of the prejudices experienced by people of the diaspora. I don't know if say helping to redress. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, helping to, address, helping to redress because who's addressing them otherwise? Right. I mean, there's a way in which making beer could be very superficial. Yeah, yeah. And when we you know, have a poster you know, saying so who's we're afraid so, of we're black. So, we're also brew at home, you know. It's yeah. not just uh, beer brewing, it's not European. Yeah. yeah, it's been a culture, it, it's Buruku tobacco home, you know, these women ferment, uh, 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 what is it called, um, these grains, and they convert it into some brew that can knock you out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow, yeah? Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> The, the what? The back, the bad and bad. The bad and bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the models, with the fantastic yellows and, and uh, the fashion shoes. Yeah. And it reminds me that there is a conversation mm -hmm. linked to what the last speaker was saying about reclaiming history and about putting black people within European history, not as immigrants, I know. just or, but actually 
as part of the longer historical narrative that mm -hmm. is rubbed out. I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly of a book came out, I think, last year by Afwa Hirsch mm -hmm. called Brit-ish, yeah, where she talks about, very interesting book, where she talks about just doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and so my question or comment really is about how to build a bridge between the conversation that that, folk, that, that image um, inspires and the, and the longer, very necessary, deeper conversation that is, being, is happening now, actually, about the diaspora, not just the diaspora experience, but the black experience is an intrinsic uh, part of a European history. And I think the, the Berlin reference was spot on there. You know, so I just wondered if, there, if you're also talking to those people who yeah, are Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's um, a lot of people think the black, uh, the African history with Europe is recent, no. It goes back to hundreds of years where we had like African scholars, African professors in universities, like in Germany, and also like with the Moors, been kind of going back and forth. So there are also like works, I mean, it's not here that we did to engage that. One of the works that I did was inspired by the Four Black Diamonds, which they did this shoot in uh, Germany in 1904, something like that, dressed in the in the dindos, the leather hosen. So but a lot of people would think like, uh, a lot of people in Germany actually think the Africans started coming over like in the last 20 years or something like that, but it's been happening for a very long time. I started with the musicians from, from America, being in uh, Germany for music concerts as far back as 1800 and uh, 1890s and stuff like that. So yes, I, I, I'm conscious of this and I've done works also around this, but I don't have them here. Uh, for this presentation, yeah. Uh, hi, I had a question about your um, your experience here in France and how it relates to the previous work in Germany. Yeah. And um, so, for example, in France, we know that uh, there's a lot of African communities as migrants, but there's also a lot of North African communities, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And so, when you spoke about going to Montrouge, you said like, oh, you know, it felt like home in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a sense of similarity and um, in, in that comment. I guess I was curious to know from your experience of working in different locales and interacting with these different communities, what the points of differences were. And of course, they reflect in terms of the flavor of the beer. Uh, and I understand that. But I guess more like uh, holistically, when you approach like African migration and diaspora through this work in different contexts, geographical contexts, mm -hmm. I mean, how does this enrich your work, uh, your artistic practice and your view more generally? Or, or like in France, did you want to maybe, you know, I mean, I know um, Nigeria is home and it's the focal point and the entry point into this conversation for you, which makes a lot of sense. But are you teased and interested in the kind of more di the diversity within the I African diaspora that you may experience in different places you work? Um, yes, and I'll start by answering that um, it's been entirely different in France. You know, um, in Africa, especially West Africa, we have this Anglophone, Francophone situation. And, you know, that's what's going on here. You will hardly find Nigerians in Paris. One, because of the language. We stay away from where uh, it's not English. It makes our life more complicated. So the, 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 uh, my experience here has been more with the Francophone Africans. And uh, I've learned quite a lot there. And that's why I also took this different approach of not trying to do this. I mean, the research started a lot with kind of this Q&A with people. But I've taken this approach of more communicating with the, with the chefs, with the people already cooking, ex, you know, like ex, designing food around two cultures. And um, that was because of uh, the whole French situation of also not understanding the language or speaking the language, how to formulate another template for this, even if I worked with researchers. So in many ways, this kind of like uh, gave me new direction on how to go about this and change that whole concept that I was working with initially. So it, it's been quite enriching in that sense. It's more about people that focuses on the flavors and the tastes already doing the shopping and buying the food and also cooking for the uh, people. Because then if you're not asking individuals like, what is the flavor of home or what is the flavor of Paris? It's more with the chef. What are people asking for? What are they ordering? What are they eating? How do you find this? How do you satisfy them? So yes, it's all a learning curve 
Every day you learn something new. Hi, thank you, Emeka. I've had the pleasure of hearing you talk about this and also consuming the beer and some of the food that goes with it. And so um, my question is, is about ask, I'm asking you to help me clarify something if you have an answer to this. And I think it connects to the first question that you said you didn't want to have anything to do with, which is the commodification of this object that is an object that's meant to be consumed like actually into our bodies, but also you want it to be in circulation and consumed as a statement, as a work of art, as mm -hmm. a part of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just kind of pushing back at that first question and asking you to talk more pointedly about who you want to consume this beer and this food and how. Um, yeah, who do you want to consume it and how and, and where and in where does it have its fullest expression of the meaning you gave to it, I guess? Well, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very challenging uh, aspect of the project. Like I said, it's, it's, not easy to, it's not easy to distribute beer. It's not easy to have it everywhere because there's a lot of rules and regulation. And like I said, there's also the beer mafia that will not want you to penetrate their market. They will come against you. So I try, I mean, the safest thing or the easiest thing is keeping it within the museum structure where it's also like kind of art. It's easier that way. Not that I want it that way, but I cannot put these things out on the street short. It takes a lot of, you're gonna get some license, you're gonna get you, it, by the time you know it, two years have gone and the beer has expired. So, yeah. so the fastest way is like, okay, with, I work with this museum, I work with this institution, it's found around this area, it's accessible to everyone, you know? So, but I cannot, I wish I can just have it been hawked outside on the streets, oh, easy like that, but it's, it's complicated. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. That was really wonderful. And also just because in a way you really gave us a, a way of thinking, yes, about beer, and, but also about translation and the way you started off um, asking that question. And I, what I want to know is I, I, I think that it's not about branding or trying to get your beer out there, but it's trying to get this idea you have that's about this kind of hybridity and fusion, which means that translation isn't sort of some kind of nostalgic trying to recreate the past or what was there in the original culture, nor is it about completely assimilating it, but it's about actually trying to work between these different things. And your work really shows this in this kind of very experimental, vital way. And so I wanted you to kind of, maybe it was following on the question that the woman in front of me asked about your work where you were celebrating which had a nostalgic aspect. And what this, this work does not seem to me very nostalgic. And, that, and that I just wanted to ask you about maybe that difference. It seems like it's a theory of translation that's really not looking at um, trying to get us back to the original at all. Um, I don't control how nostalgic my work is. <laughs> you know, to some people, just that be a connection or the advertisement, the hacks and pochoirs takes them somewhere, okay. or the taste, the flavor, the, the piment in the beer takes them somewhere, you know. Right. So, I'm not an art theorist, I just create. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this. And I saw uh, recently that um, you had a project in Sharjah. And I just wanted to ask you a question about uh, your experience in the Middle East and how it compares to your experience in Europe. And it's just there's in no terms of... There's no alcohol in Sharjah. Sorry? <laughs> there's no alcohol in Sharjah, you know. There's, well, yeah, well, there's that. So the beer project could so be shown. the beer shown. project could never work in Sharjah. <laughs> <laughs> but just in terms of the, the sort of... There's alternate centers for the art world now. And, of course, the Gulf is, again, if we're talking about money, the reason a lot is happening there is just because there's this enormous... Um, enormous amount of money going there, but just as, as establishing these um, bridges of solidarity across like Africa and the Middle East and the Far East, and just in terms of this shifting center of the of centers. So I just was wondering about, just if you have any comments about your experience working there. I don't know if you spent a lot of time there or not, but I was just curious about that. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's... A, um, my 
my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to stop, but it's it just if, it, you know, I'm just curious. If I mean, if, if you ask me about Sharjah, the first thing is like there's no alcohol in Sharjah. Right, it comes right. to my mind there. I would never, <laughs> uh, you know, like it, this is a project that will never work in Sharjah. And um, the African diaspora is also not that big there. So I never had this kind of uh, thoughts when I was trying to create something for Sharjah. You know, the work we did in Sharjah was sort of site specific and also inspired by Sharjah. I arrived in Sharjah during um, one of the floods. Uh, you know, it rained, you know, a tiny piece of rain and everything shuts down because it hardly rains there. And that was one of the entry points into the work that I did. But the Gulf being the Gulf, Sharjah is next door to Dubai, which is 30 minutes drive and you can access any booths that you can think of in Sharjah, in uh, Dubai. You know, I see, I see, I really see it a bit like a, it's really a weird situation in general because we have to drive to Dubai, take a taxi, go get a beer, get a drink. So I, I really don't get it why there's no alcohol in Sharjah and, and there's in Dubai. It's still the same UAE, and uh, you know, tourists, everyone is streaming in there. It's it's a big kind of like a mind f word for me in general, but. It is what it is, I respect it. I don't know if it answers your question, but like my brain is a little bit behind at the moment. I'm hungry. <laughs> so we think it's been a wonderful discussion, but a long one, a very active one, and we, would, we feel that maybe now we should bring the session to a close and that those who have further questions, maybe you can speak directly to the artists after Tomorrow. The